In this lecture, we're going to focus on Native American peoples of the area north of the Great Lakes in North America. We'll start with the Inuit, who lived very far north. We'll also be looking at two important characters in Native American myths, the shaman and the culture hero. Inuit means the people. We might, may know them better as Eskimos, but that's actually a pejorative name given them by other tribes. It means something like those who eat their food raw. We probably have a picture in our minds about them, a picture that includes seal and walrus and caribou hunting, and once in a while a bear. We see them moving from place to place with dog sleds or kayaks, living on ice in the winter and on the shore in summer, unless they were so far north that it never thawed, and, of course, igloos. Today, the Inuit live all across the Arctic, in Alaska, Greenland, northern Canada, and Siberia, where they must have come from in the first place. They can still build igloos if they need to, but most now live in heated houses with electricity. Theirs was the most hostile of environments. Food and simple survival were their major concerns. They had no pantheon of gods and goddesses, and no formal religion. Their only religious gatherings were impromptu seances inspired by the angakok or shaman. A shaman was, and still is, someone who has demonstrated, usually around the time of puberty, a susceptibility to trances, in which his spirit leaves his body and is said to make contact with spirits of nature or those of his people's ancestors. He can also visit, in spirit, the land of the dead. I keep saying he because most shamans were male, although there were and are women shamans too. An Inuit shaman would signal with a drum when he was being contacted or taken over by spirits, and people would gather to watch him fall into a trance, listening for what he said when entirely possessed. Afterwards, when he had returned to his own body, he would chant or tell the people what he had learned. In this way, the Inuit kept in contact with the spirit world. Inuit shamans used this contact for guidance in daily domestic matters and in larger ones, like when the water would freeze over or break up, where the caribou or shoals of fish were, or how to charm polar bears into traps. One of the most powerful of the nature spirits that the Inuit shamans contacted was the old woman who lived under the sea. In some regions, she was called Sedna. It's been said that she may be the closest the Inuit had to a real deity. She's a kind of earth mother, or maybe in this case, a sea mother. She's also sometimes the queen of the dead. Sedna got into the sea long ago as a beautiful daughter who couldn't find anyone she wanted to marry, although she had many suitors. Across the sea lived a proud seabird who heard about her and decided to marry her. He discarded his bird body and feathers and came to her as a beautiful young man. He made himself even more desirable by promising her a luxurious life of ease and pleasure if she would marry him and come to live with his people. Over her father's stout objection, she paddled away with the stranger in his kayak. After a long and difficult journey, they arrived at his village, which turned out to be poor and miserable, and where things turned out not at all as he had promised. She became desperately unhappy and wished with all her heart to return to her home and her own people. In the spring, her father came to visit her, and when he found out how unhappy she was and how she had been betrayed by the seabird, he killed her husband and took her into his kayak back out to sea. When the other seabirds discovered that her husband had been killed, they flew after the father and daughter, and their great wings whipped the waves into a huge storm. The father was terrified, but he thought that if he sacrificed his daughter to them, they would let him escape. So he threw her overboard. But Sedna swam back to the kayak and grabbed the edge of it with her fingers. Her father by now was crazed with fear, and as the seabirds came closer, he cut off her fingers to make her let go of the kayak. As the fingers fell into the water, they became whales and seals and walruses. This happened several times, each time the father cutting off more of her fingers, and each time the fingers becoming more sea creatures. The seabirds were satisfied that without fingers, Sedna would drown, so they flew back home. Sedna's father then helped her back into the kayak, but... As we can well imagine, all the way home, Sedna thought about getting even with her father. She managed it by getting her dogs, T 
to eat his hands and feet while he was asleep in his tent. And in the chaos and scrambling and cursing and screaming that ensued, a massive earthquake opened the ground beneath them and both of them and their dogs and the tent and everything else tumbled down into the underworld. There Sedna became its ruler and the supreme power. Sedna ruled the living and the dead from the bottom of the sea from that time on. She still wore her hair in braids, but without fingers, she couldn't comb it. When her hair got tangled, she grew angry and held her sea creatures back from humans. To placate her, the shaman had to go into a trance to visit her. In spirit, he went over the waters to a great whirlpool that pulled him down to a beautiful tent beneath the sea, decorated with the skins of all sea creatures. There he combed the tangles from her hair, danced and sang to amuse her, and begged her to release her sea creatures to his people. If it all worked, he could take back a message from her, and the people would find sea creatures again that they could hunt and kill and eat. The shaman was thus the most important spiritual guide for his people. But individuals could also be their own shamans when their ancestors sent them dreams. They took the dreams very seriously and acted in accordance with them. The Sedna story probably also reflects something of the dangerous environment in which the Inuit lived. Their chief deity had been savagely mistreated, and she could be hostile and touchy, and she needed frequent appeasement. Another important character in many Native American myths is the culture hero. Most Amerindian creation stories aren't about the very beginning of things, but about what happens next, once there already is an earth and sky. At that point, someone has to finish shaping and completing the earth to make it ready for human life. And that someone also has to teach the first inhabitants, whether they're human at that point or some pre-human creatures, the skills and knowledge and tools necessary to live there. We need to know about plants and how to acquire hunting power, and what medicines to use for various illnesses, and how to make pottery, and how to grow maize, and the rites and ceremonies that will get the gods to help us. Sometimes these culture heroes are deities themselves, or semi-divine deputies of the gods, sent down to give us help. Sometimes they're humans, but humans who've acquired special powers from the gods and from nature. Sometimes they make trips to the sky or to the underworld to learn things that they can bring back. These characters and the gifts they bring us are the subjects of a lot of Native American myths. The Inuit have one that features Raven. Raven is a character who shows up as a trickster in many stories of the peoples of the American Northwest. Here in this story, he's not a trickster, but a culture hero. The story starts with a man who emerges from a beach pea pod, which is like our familiar legume, but grows on sandy beaches, and this one is obviously of enormous size. He wanders about for a while trying to decide who he is and what he's doing here and what to do next. Eventually, he runs into Raven, who is as surprised to see the man as the man is to encounter Raven. Raven has the curious ability to be able to push his beak up to the back of his head, the way Daffy Duck can do in cartoons, and when he does, he becomes a man. When he pulls the beak back down, like a mask, he's a bird again. He becomes a bird to fetch the man some berries to eat. And then he makes some animals out of clay, beginning with mountain sheep and then moving on to reindeer. Each time he works with his hands as a man to make the figures and then changes back to a bird to wave his wings over them until they come to life. He makes a woman for the man and then returns to making birds and fish and bugs and beavers and muskrats simply to fill up the place and make it less lonely. With each new creation, he teaches the man the nature and uses of each new animal or bird or insect. He makes bears and teaches the man to be careful around them. He creates bows and arrows and teaches the man how to hunt and how to make snares to catch reindeer. By now, three more men have emerged from that same pea pod, and Raven takes them off in different directions, teaching all of them and making wives for them, too. He makes a land in the sky, the upper world, and then he takes the first man to visit it. Then Raven takes the man to the bottom of the sea, where he creates a host of new sea creatures. When they finally wind up back on Earth some years later, the other people have multiplied so fast that Raven is afraid they will kill all the animals. 
So he makes some giant reindeer with pointed teeth to kill and eat some of the humans. As a further ecological protection, Raven takes the sun out of the sky so people have to live in complete darkness. He assumes that without light, they will eventually die or at least stop multiplying so fast. But Raven has a brother who turns himself into a small leaf, which Raven's wife drinks with a cup of water, and thereby Raven's brother impregnates her with himself. He's reborn as Raven Boy, and as a small child he keeps begging to be allowed to play with the son, which Raven keeps in his house. To get the child to stop whining, Raven eventually allows Raven Boy to play with it, and of course he steals it and returns it to the sky, so people will survive. So this story actually has two culture heroes. Raven is the primary one until he begins to worry about humans overrunning the Earth, and then Raven Boy takes over, using some of the techniques of the trickster to get the sun back in its place. Between them, they show what culture heroes do. I mentioned that Raven can move back and forth between being human and being a bird just by flipping his beak up or down. In many Native American stories, a character can move back and forth in this way. Sometimes he's a coyote, sometimes a man. Sometimes she's an otter, sometimes a woman. And when we're reading or hearing the story, we can imagine the character in whichever way we want or need to to see him or her in order to make the story work. In each state, the character can do things that are appropriate for that state. There are many stories in which a bear, say, enters his house, takes off his bearskin, and hangs it up on a wall peg, revealing a fully human person underneath, at which point he starts acting more like a man and less like a bear. We saw in the Sedna story that the seabirds in it can appear either as birds or as humans. It's how in so many stories a human woman can marry a male bear, or a human male can marry a female deer, or, as in Sedna's case, a bird can marry a woman. What lies behind all of these transformations is the assumption that animals are pretty much like people, with minds and wills of their own, and their own political and social organization. And Native Americans mostly believe that they have to be dealt with more or less the same way they dealt with people. It was believed that, especially at the beginning, in the mythical age, humans and animals could change back and forth at will, again suggesting how tenuous the border is that divides humans and animals. At the time of puberty, young men and women would embark on a vision quest, a ritualistic effort to establish special relations with one or more animals, and thereby acquire powers from those animals for life. Part of the vision quest, which marked the passage from childhood to adulthood, involved fasting alone until a young person was granted a helpful vision that confirmed the new relationship with an animal or bird. A Choctaw story from what is now Alabama and Mississippi in North America puts that kind of vision and special relationship into a story about a hunter who was amazingly unlucky. He was able to find deer, but he never quite managed to kill one. One day, he rescues an alligator who's dying from heat and from being away from the water for way too long. He carries the alligator to the water, and the alligator gives him a special gift and power. From that day on, he's a brilliantly successful hunter. Sometimes the prey animal itself was the one that granted the special power. In a Wasco story from what is now Oregon, a boy receives an elk as his guardian spirit, and the elk helps him become a great hunter of all game, elk included. He also teaches the boy never to be arrogant or to kill more animals than he has to. But one day the boy's father, who's something of a blowhard and a braggart, taunts his son into killing more than he needs to as a kind of demonstration of personal skill. The elk spirit immediately deserts him, and the boy dies a few days later. Native Americans felt mostly that they killed animals not only because of their own talents or weapons, but because the animals offered themselves or gave hunters the power to do so. But in order to keep that relationship, hunts had to be conducted in certain ways, preceded by fasts and other preparation, managed under certain conditions and rules, and gratitude had to be expressed in the way one treated a slain animal. 
the relationship between animals and Native Americans was a very close one and very different from our own. The Ojibwa were hunters of the northern forests. They lived south of the Inuit, and they told another culture hero story that offers some valuable insights into the complex relationship between humans and animals in Native American thought. Like other peoples of the northern forests, they hunted deer and beaver and other small forest animals. It was too cold to support maize, so agriculture came to them late and in mostly minor ways. Their principal plant food was wild rice, and their myths reflected their hunting culture. The Ojibwa occupied what's now the United States from Michigan to Montana and central Canada from Quebec to Saskatchewan. The story concerns their culture hero, Nanbozo, or Nanabush, or Nanabushu, who appears at different times in this cycle of stories as a rabbit, a wolf, a toad, and even once as a tree stump. He's also a trickster, and there are as many stories about him in that role as there are about him as a culture hero. The two roles, trickster and culture hero, often coincide in Native American myths. We noticed a few moments ago that Raven, the culture hero of the Inuit story, is in many other places a trickster, even though in the one we looked at, he's a pretty straightforward culture hero. The part of trickster in that story is taken by his brother, who turns himself into a leaf that gets swallowed in a cup of water by Raven's wife, who then gives birth to Raven Boy, who then steals the sun from Raven and restores it to the sky. Nanabushu was also a trickster, but in these stories he too is mostly a culture hero. The story we'll be following is a composite one, pieced together from many myths told by people, complete with a bewildering number of variations. We need also to remember that Native Americans' myths were told, not written down to be read. And the versions we have are simply those that got recorded by an anthropologist. The Nanabushu stories were told widely enough that we have a lot of variations. If you hunt down some of them, you'll probably notice some significant differences from the story we'll consider here. Most of the stories I'll draw on were collected by the ethnographer William Jones from 1903 to 1905 in various places north of Lake Superior. Nanabushu is born either as part of a set of twins or triplets or from a clot of blood from the birthing process. His mother had been impregnated by the wind. She dies in childbirth when Nanabushu's brothers argue over who gets to be born first, and they end up tearing their mother apart. Nanabushu, in any case, has a hero's requisite miraculous conception and birth. Early on, he turns himself into a rabbit and steals fire for his grandmother, either from the sky or from some divine fire guardians. He does it by dancing so close to the fire that he lights his own fur and then runs blazing home like a comet, showing some of his trickster skills. The culture hero in this way gives fire to his people. When he discovers that it was his brothers who killed his mother, he sets out to avenge her. He kills his younger brother with the help from a weasel, who tells him that his brother's only vulnerable spot is the top knot in his hair. As the brother is dying, he tells Nanabushu that by killing him, Nanabushu has brought death into the world. All the people who come later will have to die. Nanabushu says that without death, the world would get too crowded and food would become scarce, so death maybe isn't all that bad. He also makes his brother ruler of the land of the dead, so that, as he says, when people die, they simply move from one land to another. He kills a second brother with help from a swan and a blue jay. He scalps that brother, the first scalping in history, and thereby introduces the rituals that people will use from then on after killing an enemy. Again, these are the kind of things a culture hero does. He spends one winter traveling with a wolf pack, becoming a wolf himself for the time being, partly because wolves are excellent hunters and Nanabushu is always hungry. But he and the animals are different enough that there are problems. Once he actually manages inadvertently to kill one of the wolves, he brings him back to life, but the wolves force Nanabushu to leave, allowing one wolf to go with him to do his hunting so that he won't starve to death. He and the wolf become good friends, and Wolf is a magnificent hunter. 
But Nanabushu starts having nightmares about something bad about to happen to his wolf companion. He cautions the wolf to be very careful, but along the way the wolf manages to violate some taboo and is killed for it by the leader of the water Manitos, a powerful semi-divine creature of the underworld. The footnote provided by the translator of the version I'm using says that the Manito is a water monster of the sea, lakes, and rivers. So again, Nanabushu sets out to avenge a death. This time he disguises himself as a tree stump on the shore of a place where the Manitos, there are a lot of them, come to the surface of the water to sleep in the afternoon sun. He's helped by a kingfisher who tells Nanabushu not to shoot directly at the Manito leader, but at his shadow. Nanabushu, though, remember, is always also a trickster, and in typical trickster fashion, he forgets the instruction and shoots the first arrow directly at the side of the creature. He only manages to wound it, not to kill it. But Nanabushu later meets Toad Woman, who turns out to be the mother of the wounded Manito, and who's on her way to cure him. Nanabushu stays with the Toad Woman long enough to learn a lot of her lore before he kills her, skins her, and then puts on her skin. So, disguised as Toad Woman herself, he manages to get into the Manito underwater camp. And there, pretending to cure the offending creature, he actually twists and digs the arrow in its side until he kills it. The Manitos respond to the death of their leader by flooding the entire Earth. Nanabushu survives in different ways in different versions of the story. In the version we're following, a kingfisher advises him to build a raft, and he stays afloat. When the water finally stops rising, he rescues a few animals who have survived, pulls them onto his raft, and gets them to dive for pieces of the old earth down under all that water. All die in the attempt, but a muskrat makes it back up with a bit of earth before he dies. Nanabushu brings them all back to life and then uses that bit of the muskrat's mud to make a new earth, letting it dry out and then expanding it. It's interesting that here we have a pretty standard earth diver creation myth. Variations of this one are found all over North America, except for Arizona and New Mexico. Here, it's not the very first creation account, but a reboot after a universal flood. Interestingly, that earth diver story is also a common one in Siberia and Magyar Hungary and the eastern Baltic states and in northern Asia. The unlikelihood of even imagining such a universal flood, let alone actually experiencing it in the middle of a large continent like North America, suggests that this story came originally from an Asian coastal area. It must have spread westward from there to Siberia and come across the Bering Strait with the first continental immigrants. Anyway, having created a new Earth, Nanabushu then does more culture hero work. He names all the animals and birds and fish. He decides the length of time for the moon cycle, and he tames the winds to make them serviceable to human hunters. When he's finished, he says that he's now completed the creation of everything from which people will derive life. And then he goes hunting. Christopher Vesey, in his book Imagine Ourselves Richly, says that the most noticeable thing about the Nanabushu cycle is how pervasive death is in it. It occurs in virtually every episode. But we also notice that every death brings a benefit to the people who will inherit the planet. The death of Nanabushu's mother, for example, leads to the birth of a culture hero. The death of Nanabushu's wolf companion leads to the death of the water monster, which leads to the flood and the creation of a new earth. All the creatures who dive for pieces of earth die in their efforts. Even if Nanabushu revives them, death seems in some way a prerequisite to progress, to growth, to making things better. Nanabushu himself is responsible for bringing death into the world. When his brother he's just killed is dying, he tells Nanabushu that he has just done a terrible thing. But Nanabushu says that death is necessary for life to go on, since there wouldn't be room for new people if old ones didn't die, and there wouldn't be enough food to go around either. What the myth tells us, says Vesey, is that the Ojibwa thought of death not simply as terrible, but as necessary for the continuation of life. The Ojibwa, after all, were a people who lived by hunting, and a hunting culture has to believe 
that the death of animals is necessary for the continued life of people. And that, Vesey says, is the point of this myth. As we saw earlier, Native Americans saw humans and animals as part of the same order of creation. But there are important differences. A series of animals gives Nanabushu help along the way, telling him how to kill his brothers and how to kill the water manito and bringing up a piece of mud from which a new earth could be made. But people and animals, as connected as they are, don't see the world in exactly the same way. The wolves are reluctant to take Nanabushu into their pack, and when he's with them, he makes a lot of mistakes from their point of view, and they do a lot of odd things from his. He eventually gets expelled from the pack. He gets to take one wolf with him, and that wolf's killing by the Manitou is what triggers Nanabushu's revenge, which triggers the flood, which triggers the creation of a new world. But the expulsion itself is important, since it suggests that in some fundamental ways, animals and humans see the world differently enough that they cannot live too closely together. Part of the Ojibwa point is that they had to kill animals to survive. They had too short a growing season for maize, and they couldn't live on rice, berries, and fish, the last especially true for those far from important rivers or lakes. Hunting is what kept them alive, and sometimes, as their stories make clear, it just barely kept them alive. So many of the stories we haven't talked about in the Nanabushu cycle are about being hungry, about running out of food, about not, not knowing how one can feed one's children. There are many stories about trickster Nanabushu running out of food and going to someone's lodge, hanging around until someone offers him a meal. Typically the host, an eagle or woodpecker or a skunk, has a special way of getting food, which Nanabushu tries to emulate when he gets back home with invariably disastrous and often comic results. Vesey points out that in some versions of the myth cycle, the water Manito kills Nanabushu's wolf companion because the wolf is too good a hunter. So the Manito is protecting game by killing an overly successful hunter. That's really not explicit in the version we just summarized, but it may very well be in the margins or between the lines. That would mean that when Nanabushu kills the Manito, he's not only avenging the death of his friend, but he's also asserting the right of hunters to kill what they need, to take from the animal kingdom enough to guarantee the continuation of life. The second creation story might say the same thing. After creating the new world and then stocking it, Nanabushu goes off to hunt. He gets in this story some very dim-witted geese to dance with their eyes closed while he wrings their necks. That's a trickster story. Some people think that they detect a parallel here with the story of Noah in the Old Testament. After the flood, Yahweh gives Noah and his family the right to kill animals for food. Prior to that time, people were presumably vegetarians. So the new covenant that humans make with God in that story breaks an older covenant with animals who will now be hunted and killed for food. This story isn't precisely parallel to that one. In the Ojibwa story, there was hunting and killing and eating animals before the flood. It's perhaps the overly successful hunting of the wolf companion that angered the Manito in the first place. And it's his death that causes the flood. After the new earth is big enough to support animals, the first thing Nanabushu does is to fill it with game, and the second is that he goes hunting. Nanabushu's greatest gift as a culture hero for the Ojibwa may have been to liberate them to hunt freely so that the people can survive. Strong objections from powerful forces like the Manito have been dealt with, set aside, eliminated. A new earth has been replenished with game, and for the Ojibwa, Nanabushu was also the patron of the hunt. The old bond with animals has been changed. It will never be as close as it once was before Nanabushu. Animals and humans still have a covenant. Remember how often in the story Nanabushu was helped or even saved by weasels and kingfishers and wolves. But in the second creation, humans have the upper hand, which they absolutely had to have to survive those long, cold winters in the subarctic. And death, here specifically the death of animals, 
is acknowledged as a prerequisite of life, specifically of human life. That's the kind of gift a culture hero brings. No wonder such a gift is considered sacred and that stories about culture heroes loom so large in Native American mythology.